babies kicking around. So does that correspond to REM, non-REM? It's not totally clear. So the answer is we don't know. And it, we simply don't know ex exactly when was your first moment, when, when was your first conscious experience? Because you don't remember any of that because we all have childhood amnesia, you know, for the first two or three years of our life. So it's very difficult to be sure at this point when you were first conscious. Sorry, uh, just uh, before uh, continuing the conversation, are you all okay with recording this? Because there were a lot of people interested later on. I have a, a glass of the discussion. If you all agree, I will keep on with the recording. If not, you, you are welcome to say that you don't agree, and I will stop it. So all fine? Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you, Christoph. Also, um, I hope you agree to record this discussion. Yep. Thank you. And by the way, I think the microphone should work better now. Uh, should you can you speak? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you speak better? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. I mean, okay. <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh, what are the tools? Hi there, can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, faintly. All right, um, so uh, my name is uh, Amand. Uh, largely like I'm interested in, you know, building intelligence and also, you know, sentience or consciousness is very interesting as well. So I'm curious what your view would be on the importance of structure in conscious systems. So for instance, there's like an idea that you can just have this physical substrate that's like relatively homogenous, that's just consisting of these self-interacting pieces that will, cause consciousness to emerge or intelligence to emerge in a useful way. And then there's another idea that is that it may rely on some high level modularity where, you know, like the brain has these different regions and it's all very organized in both the high level and the low level. You know, there's homogeneity in regions, but there's also large differences across it. I'm curious, like, do you have any thoughts or, uh, you know, intuitions about the difference between those types of architectures for intelligence or consciousness and how they might play out? Well, A, you have to distinguish intelligence and consciousness. They're two radical different things. They're very different. In us, they, in biological systems, particularly in, in uh, us or other mammals, they, they go hand in hand. In other words, we're intelligent, we're also conscious. But you can certainly imagine a computer system, for example, that are conscious, uh, that are intelligent, um, i.e. in their behavior. Intelligence ultimately is about doing, right? What do you do at what time scale? given the complexity of the world and many interacting agents at different spatial temporal scales. Consciousness isn't about that. Consciousness is more a state of being. You know, you, you're happy or sad or see something or hear something or depressed. Um, and conversely, you can imagine systems, for example, uh, cerebral organoids that are conscious yet not intelligent. So we, we either have to talk about intelligence or we have to talk about consciousness. So if, assuming your question is about consciousness, the answer is, at least per integrated information theory, it's really both. It's both differentiation and integration. That's exactly what consciousness is. Because you're, and so the substrate should reflect that. And that's what this conscious meter, for example, that is being tested now. You want a substrate that's both highly differentiated, right? And we know that's the case in the brain. You are, you're typically brains, there aren't just one or two cell types, just like there are one or two or three transistor types in a computer, but there are several thousand different types of cells. So it's highly differentiated. But as you point out, it's also integrated, right? There's visual cortex and high order visual cortex, which is different from auditory cortex, which is different from prefrontal cortex, et cetera. So it's really the, uh, you want a system that maximizes both differentiation and integration simultaneously. Of course, you can maximize just differentiation, right? Then you get something like you maximize, that's equivalent to maximizing entropy, but that's not what consciousness is. Or you can, uh, you can maximize uh, integration, then in principle, you have you know, one wire connecting everything to everything, uh, and that's not good either. So it's really the sweet point between um, trying to uh, drive both integration as well as differentiation high. That's what results in high levels of consciousness. And that's reflected in the physical substrate, at least for our brains. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kopp. Um, any questions in online? 
uh, what do you think are the most promising tools to detect conscious uh, conscious activity? Well, so there's one tool. The, 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 so there are these patients, they're so-called disorders of consciousness patient, DOC. They're both acute and chronic. The best known ones are chronic. When uh, people are, let's say, following a stroke or uh, a heart attack or traumatic brain injury, they are on life support. Um, they're not comatose, so they, they have periods where they open their eyes. They might moan or, or move sort of reflectively, reflexively. But you can, if you ask them, Miss, Mrs. So-and-so, can you hear me? Can you move your eye? Can you move your head? Can you move your finger? Can you see anything? They can't. So in this case, and there are thousands of people like that, you're not sure if there's anyone home or not. They don't show any voluntary responses. So in this case, people have developed this tool whereby you perturb the brain using magnetic pulse. So essentially, think of a bell and you hit the bell with a hammer, and then you, look, you are lo listening to the resonances. That's essentially what you're doing. You're hitting the brain with the magnetic pulse. It induces current you know, via, law, uh, via induction, induces currents um, that triggers underlying neurons and that give rise to sort of electrical activity in the EG. You measure that, and per the answer to the previous question, you measure its differentiation and integration using something like lentil ziv, essentially. You essentially, you ask how compressible is it? And uh, that tool seems to be very good at telling whether these people are conscious. If, the, if the, the, um, the complexity is defined in this way, it's above a certain measure, everyone on whom it has been tested appears to be conscious. If it's below a minimal complexity, they're either deeply asleep or they're anesthetized or they're in a true coma or they're in a vegetative state, but truly unconscious. So that seems to be a way how we can measure it in humans and in closely related an, an animals like non-human primates or mice that also have a, a neocortex. <clears throat> so, um, maybe we can now move to, um, to the second point. Um, do you want to? I'm sorry, I, I don't hear anything. Oh, sorry, uh, I was not speaking loud enough. Uh, I think we can move to the second topic we were uh, proposing. Um, so the second is, uh, where does integrated information theory stand in the broad range of philosophical viewpoint, like panpsychism, dualism, idealism, and materialism? And I hope like everybody is acquainted or not with these terms. So maybe, maybe. Yes, maybe, maybe Professor Koch, if you can give us like a brief definition of what all of these uh, terms sure, are. Sure, it's only yeah. 3,000 years of Western philosophy. <laughs> okay. Well, I, so the two poles around which the debate in philosophy of mind revolves is, ideal, is idealism materialism. So one pole says everything is matter. And, and a, a sort of a more modern version of that is, is, uh, is called physicalism, because of course we know there's matter and energy, and then there's dark matter and dark energy. So it's called, so the modern version is called physicalism. It's all it's all physics, and that's all there is. So that's, uh, you know, that's one pole in this force field where philosophers discuss consciousness. The other one is idealism, uh, that everything is really in the mind. Everything is mind, and matter is just a, or energy is just a, uh, a manifestation of, of mind. That's less popular today. There are some idealists around, but it's much less popular. Dualism tries to combine the two in an uneasy alliance. It tries to say, well, like the classical dualism is Cartesian dualism, which most people, certainly in this country, sort of believe in, in some sort of dualism that says there's, there's clearly a physics, you know, there's a brain, it's clearly a physical system and subject to all the laws of physics, quantum mechanics, you know, uh, gravity, etc. But then there's also mind, my, my soul, you know, uh, most people will call it. And, and uh, so this is what Rene Descartes proposed 400 years ago, right? Famously, he said that there's two sorts of stuff. There's physical stuff. He called it res extant, stuff that has physical extension, like brains and bodies and stars and planets and whatnot. And there's res cogitans, cognitive stuff, thinking stuff. And, and um, ultimately, what he meant by that is, is, uh, is a soul. Um, but then the problem always has been from the early on, people have pointed out, well, if it's really ineffable thinking stuff, how does the thinking stuff make the 
make the, the, the material stop, the brain do stop, you know, how, how does it make me, you know, I can think about it and I can raise my hand. Well, if it's, if it's non-physical, how, how can it do that? And shouldn't there be some sort of energy exchange? And, and where was the thinking stuff before there was, um, you know, a brain? And where's the thinking stuff going to go after the brain sort of decays? So it's, it's very incoherent. So there are very there are few physic, um, dualists le uh, left. Panpsychism is a very ancient belief, uh, both in the West as, as well as um, in Eastern tradition, for example, Buddhist tradition, that says, well, everything is in soul, everything is in mind to a smaller or larger extent. So all of matter is a little bit mind. I mean, uh, you know, it's not hugely in minded, but there is a little bit of, and then bigger things like, like uh, let's say, single cell uh, amoeba, a little bit more in minded, and then you know, animals have more mind, and then you finally you come to humans, they have a lot of mind. So, so a modern version of that by uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, sort of is called um, Russellian monism, essentially says, well, everything has two aspects. There's the external aspects, that's what you can report from a third person point of view, you know, so that's a physical system. But this physical system also has an internal aspect, what it feels like to be from the inside, and that's consciousness. So according to panpsychism, conscience is exactly how a complex system like the brain feels like. Of course, you then have to explain, well, does a heart also feel like something? And does my liver feel like something? You know, and does my, you know, uh, my kidney feel like something? Now, IIT, so people always ask, well, is IIT one or the other? And it's different. IIT is a scientific theory. It might be wrong. It's testable. And so it has intuitions that are panpsychic. So for example, it says, yes, even simple systems, probably as long as they have integrated information, as long as they have causal power upon themselves, they are conscious. They may not be conscious of a lot. In the limit, they may be only conscious of one thing, but they, but they are conscious. So th that's an intuition that it shares with panpsychism. It's not dualistic because it just says, well, you have a physical system, like the brain's physics, but then you have to unfold its causal power and its causal power upon itself. That's what consciousness is. So you can say, well, that's more like physicalism. It just extends the physical to include both um, ex external causal power as studied in physics, as well as internal causal power. So it shares sort of intuition with a lot of these different school, ancient schools. I mean, you have to understand philosophies are sort of, they think in very broad category where any one specific theory, you know, might transgress the, 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 the standard definitions of idealism or materialism or panpsychism. I'm actually wondering if anyone has some kind of favorite among these years <laughs> of this theory. Christoph, may I, may I request you to just clarify for everyone that uh, psychological properties and the property of subjective experience are emergent from these integrated networks? No, they're not emergent. So, so what's meant by emergent? So classical view of emergence is like um, heat emerges from kinetic motion, right? It's, it's really the same thing, but it, it's sort of at the microscopic level. If you don't have, you know, if you only have one molecule, uh, you're not going to get uh, uh, heat, but if you have a lot of them, you know, mole of them, or, or wetness, another emergent property is wetness, okay, if you have one H2O molecule, it's not wet, if you have two, you get maybe hydrogen bond, bonds, but you don't get wetness, if you get 10 to the 23, then you have this, this property that we call uh, wetness, and many people th think, have this intuition, well, consciousness is just like that, you know, you get two neons, you're not conscious, and 42, you're not conscious, but you know, once you have a million or billion, then you know, you get two systems that have consciousness. IIT is again very different. It says no, it has all it's all about integrated information. As soon as you have a system that has integrated information, if it's just a tiny bit above zero, so as soon as it's irreducible to a subset, integrated information essentially means a system is not reducible to its component anymore without losing something in the process. Even if it's a tiny itsy bitsy bit, it's already, it, it, technically it feels like something. Now in us, it's vastly bigger because we have these incredible complex, highly differentiated and integrated brain. But so per IT doesn't emerge. So, so it's a, going 
going by that line of thought, uh, Christoph, can you hear me? Yeah, if you get closer to the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got closer now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, going by that line of thought, uh, what's the minimum uh, minimal subunit that you can break down uh, the IIT into? Is there you know, in principle, a single unit that, that has a recurrent connection already, in principle, has some, if you look at the mass or two units that are, in, that are connected, um, it already feels like something. Now, would you ask me what? The only thing you can differentiate is this from that. There is no other distinction. It doesn't feel, it doesn't know about space or time or colors or anything. It just knows about this versus that. So that's, you know, going back to the question, what does it feel like to be a fetus? Well, maybe at very early stages, it, it feels like very, very little because there is so little differentiation and integration there yet. So IIT does have this intuition that, that Integrated information may go down to levels where typically we don't think there's mind. You know, we think mind is associated with us, and then maybe with a few other sort of charismatic creatures like you know great apes and maybe great whales and you know you know a few other dogs, of course, and cats. But but IIT has this intuition. No, it may be much more widely uh, widespread. So, for example, if you look at a single cell amoeba. Right, has a trillion molecules, probably 5,000 different proteins. No one has ever managed to model the complexity in a single cell like a paramecium because it's vast complex. And it may feel an itsy bitsy bit like something, this single cell amoeba. Not a lot, you know, it, it doesn't worry about the weekend, you know, it doesn't have an ego, but it may feel like something. And when it dissolves, when its membrane dissolves and all the, the, the inside stuff, the organelles leaks out, it doesn't feel like anything anymore. Well, you mentioned that IIT is testable. Uh, so if I have to test it, I, I, I have to be able to quantify it. How do I quantify each information bit? Is it like, like is there, do you have any explanation of that? Yeah, so in principle, so the way to, to verify any theory of consciousness, you have to verify it in those, first in those cases when we are undoubtedly sure that there is consciousness, like the human brain, probably because you can, you can talk to people, you can do experiments on people and, you know, in, for example, in the OR and talk to them about it. So in principle, IIT says, you know, the level of granularity is the one that maximizes integrated information. So in principle, you have to look at the atomic level, the molecular level, the, you know, the, the, the levels of, um, you know, at the membrane, the levels of synaptic levels, suborganal levels, organal levels, etc. Now, of course, we can sh hopefully shortcut this process because we have intuition. It's probably at the time scale of tens of milliseconds at the level of neurons. But again, this is testable. You have to measure the causal power of the system. Uh, you know, so you, you make a transition for building matrix, right? You look at your elements, you define your elements. So let's say they're neurons. And let's say we're looking at spiking in 10 milliseconds, for instance, or 100 milliseconds or one millisecond, whatever you want. And then you write down the transition probability matrix. You compute the intrinsic power and you say, well, is it maximized at this level or that level? And, and then you can try to, in humans, you can do that. You can try to verify that level. Is that the relevant level at which consciousness actually arises in, in people, which you can do. You can stimulate it um, in patients or in normal people. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. So ultimately you have to start with people and test any theory. This doesn't just apply to IT, this applies to any theory. You have to test it in conscious, you know, adult human beings and then you can extrapolate it to, uh, to systems that are different, like other mammals, then, you know, or to babies or fetuses that may be quite different, or to patients that can be very damaged, or to non-mammalian species. Let's say you can look at squids that are very complex, or bees, or, um, you know, octopus, or other creatures. Uh, you know, so slowly you can extend these tests as you become more comfortable with having found something that works for for humans. Okay, I I have a bunch of follow up questions, but I'll let others speak. Yeah. Can you get closer to the screen again? Sorry, where was it? Yeah. <laughs> um, hi. So. Um, uh, so my name is Avitar. I'm in, um, I'm in climate science, so not related, but, um, the, I was, um, 
interested in your presentation, you mentioned that um, you don't think that a simulated brain could have consciousness. So I wonder, under under your definition of consciousness, um, I mean, a simulated brain can have both integrated information and causal power upon itself. So why don't you think? That simulated integrated information and simulated causal power. You're in climate science? Yes. So does it get, in one of your computer simulation, does it ever get wet? Does it ever rain, actually? No, but we're... Why not? Well, if... if so, so the distinction we're making... I mean, so, so what, what is the importance of the physical substrate? Well, so it's all about the physical substrate. Look, let's take even more dramatic example. Take a simulation of the black hole at the center of our gravity, right? Six million solar masses, right? Now, if you run this simulation, you don't have to be afraid that you're going to be sucked up, that space suddenly is going to close around the computer simulation, right? And you and the computer is going to be sucked into the black hole. Why not? Same reason for why your, your weather simulation, it doesn't actually rain because your simulation does not have the causal power to bend space time. Your simulation don't have power to actually make it, make it uh, rain. They can create rain in the simulated world, but that's very different, right? So causal power ultimately is a physical thing. You know, in terms of gravity, it bends space time. It's not just, you know, it's a physical thing. It's not just information. It actually causes things to happen. So, so according to IIT, consciousness is this intrinsic causal power. So you, the way you, you have to look at it is actually, let's look at the physics of the system. Forget about what's simulated. Ultimately, you have to look at the transistors that shuttle charges around, you know, at whatever gigahertz from one gate to the next gate. You have to look at the connectivity. And then you can do an analysis, which we have done at that level, given the... Of course, the speed is dramatically higher than sort of the, the speed of the human brain or brains. But what's radical different is the connectivity. So a typical neuron is connected 10,000, 50,000 other cells and gets input from you know, 50,000 other cells. And there's huge overlap. That really makes for a lot of causal powers given all the vast combinatorics. Computers typically, you know, you have it's wide up to one or three other transistors in the in the ALU or the you know the 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 business part of the of the computer. And so it's causal, its ability to change itself is very low at that particular time scale, you know, at the time scale of uh, let's say you know a nanosecond or a fraction of a nanosecond where the clock cycle operates. So it's not about simulation. You it's not about computation. So this says, you know. Consciousness isn't about simulation. It's not about uh, computation. It's not about input-output transformation. That all relates to intelligence, but that doesn't relate to consciousness. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, I, I, yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree that current computers don't have the connectivity of of brains, but um, if if you or, or the computational power, if you had the computational power to uh, simulate such connectivity, then would you say that? No, no, because it's, again, yeah, so people, have, you know, we, we do this here at my institute, of course we simulate bra brains. We do it all the time, we publish it, you know, uh, but, 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 but that's very different. That's like you publishing about uh, that it rains and people, astrophysicists publishing about black holes. That's different from actually creating the causal power of a black hole or creating the causal power of a hurricane or of a rainstorm. It's Maybe just, I, I mean, computation is fundamentally different from causal power. We, I mean, and it's difficult for us to understand because we, we are surrounded by information and, you know, there's all this talk about metaverse and all of that, but, but, but that neglects the physics. Ultimately, it's a, it's, it's, we, we run against, we ha you have to look at the physics of the actual system. Now, in principle, you can you can build, you know, if you build so-called neuromorphic devices, right, like Kawami that Caltech, uh, you know, did for a while, you know, that have very high fan in and fan out, uh, similar to the brain, yeah, then, then too you would get 
uh, consciousness, right? Consciousness isn't, there isn't some magical properties that only wet brains have, right? In principle, it can be replicated in, in appropriate other technologies like, like, um, like silicon or you know, maybe some other more exotic technology. But right now, if you look at conventional digital, com classical digital, again, it may be different for quantum computers. But if you look at classical, conventional, von Neumann, digital computers, you look at their uh, causal power, it's puny independent of what they simulate, independent of the software that's running on them. Okay, thank you. Okay, Christoph, may I ask a follow-up question with respect to what we, we were talking? Like, supposedly we create a tiny universe simulated universe, right? Because there are black holes, you know, and there are systems within those defined simulation, you know, that suffer the consequences of that black hole or anything you can define. You know, it's not the real world, but they do suffer the consequences. So are those, I mean, is this not real just because they are in a simulation? You know, what, what if there, there are systems within that simulation that are behaving any way similar to what we believe is consciousness? Yeah, but they and don't. They the consequences within their system, you know, is that not consciousness? No, it, I mean, it, uh, if it doesn't have a, a causal power upon itself at, at the level of the substrate, according to this, it is not conscious. What do you find a substrate? I mean, in this what, case, whatever the physical substrate is. So, in a right now, if it's if you're running it on a computer, it's the level, it's the transistor level. That's a relevant substrate because mm -hmm. that's actually where the where, where where the physics takes where the action. That's where the rubber hits the road, right? That's where the computation takes place. It's a series of AND gates and NOR gates and and uh, yeah, NAND gates. That's where the computation is happening, and that happens, you know, in, in a billion transistors at a till, you know, at a clock rate of a of, of 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 several gigahertz. But ultimately, the computation happens at the level of the individual gates. So that's why you have to look just like in the brain. In the brain, same thing. In the brain, you also look at the hardware level. It's not different. It's not that one system is treated differently than the than the other system. In both cases, you have to look at the level of the the, the physical substrate. In any case, our universe itself can be, you can explain in the same way, you know, you have like fundamental particles, fundamental forces that create the interactions that create us, right? So if, if we can recreate something that in, like in this substrate level, it's not exactly the same substrate, but behaves, you know, like from that, and interacts in a way that we can understand us the same way as we are. I mean, I, yeah, I, so I, it, I, it, I personally believe that that wouldn't make it much different from like a consciousness in my in my own brain because I also have like a substrate from by which I am created, you know. Okay, so according to IT, makes all the difference. Yes, you you, you can simulate, pay, but there's no question. Look, you can already talk. You can ask Alexa. Do you have Alexa there or Siri? Ask her whether she's <laughs> conscious. Okay, no, I'm serious. Ask her. She'll tell you. All right, but that's just behavior, right? You know, that's easy to fake. It's a deep fake. Yeah, of course, Alexa will tell you she's conscious. I think actually because so many people ask her, they now give some pre-programmed coy answer. But that's exactly the point. It's, all, it's a deep fake. Yes, and of course, as computers get better and better, right? I mean, there's this program Lambda. I've interacted with Lambda, you know, the, the Google program. It's very impressive. You can have a conversation with it, and it, it then claims it's conscious. You know, and it, it talks, it's, it's very, it's linguistic capability are quite surprising, you know, um, um, but according to IT, it's all a deep fake. It's just input output transformation. And if, if of course, if you believe that all humans that all, they're just a lookup table, they just transform input into output. Yeah, then, then, um, then, then these systems are, are as conscious as any other input output system. Uh, what about embodied artificial agents? What about what? Embodied artificial agents. Uh, the same system. Problem. You. It depends what their what their subset is. If you if they're made out of brains, you know, like uh, organoids, and you put organoids in them, yeah, then they they because the the um, the complexity of these brains is such that they'll have very high degrees of integrated information, but. Right now, all the digital agents I know, you know, ultimately you have a bunch of robots playing soccer, you know, RoboCup or whatever, but they all use conventional digital, you know, CPUs. And so again, they are as, they're not conscious. They might be very good. They might be very intelligent. They might be very good at kicking a ball around or doing whatever they do, but behavior is different from consciousness. So um, any other questions here? 
Oh, we have one. I think that's the last question, and then we pass to the next topic. Please. Yeah. Um, can you speak louder to see if maybe can, if he can hear you from there? Oh, um, yeah. I can. Um, so I was curious, um, you know, in like the brain-like things and where the substrate is sort of, uh, you know, it's uh, like the brain and it has this instantaneous update and it's sort of a dynamical system that is actively like interfering with itself across time. Uh, with respect to the integrated information theory, how would that contrast with uh, systems where, you know, they're more like iterated maps? So as opposed to being a sort of continuously evolving dynamical system like the brain seems to be, uh, if each of the submodules, like the neuron-like entities, uh, instead interacted with, you know, let's say a finite length, uh, you know, piece of information and then made an update and then kept on, like, basically you discretize this sort of update rule as opposed to having uh, pure dynamics like the brain. Is integrated information theory sort of on the side of calling that conscious? Or would that be considered a hack, uh, you know, like these? No, I mean, it really depends. So honest answers, I don't know. It really depends on the details. You have to look at, you, you know, people say the brain is continuous, but of course, you know, if you look at given the noise, the ambient noise in the system, A, there's a noise floor, uh, B, spikes are digital. And, you know, probably for most of the stuff in your brain, the resolution is one or two milliseconds. And I bet you, if you do everything at the, at the delta T of one millisecond, you know, make it discrete, I'm not sure you would get much of a difference. So my, my intuition is it, that probably shouldn't make, you know, if you're in that, if you're at the relevant spatial temporal scale, it probably shouldn't make too much difference whether it's discrete or, or it's certainly asynchronous, it's certainly not clock. The brain isn't clock. It's more asynchronous, but non, but non clock. Mm -hmm. My gut feeling is that discretization doesn't matter too much, but it would have to be, you know, tested. And if you were to increase the sort of complexity of the computation and then increase the duration of this time step so that let's say that it was like 20 milliseconds or like an order of magnitude change, but you also made the neuron interaction, you know, logic that much more complex. Do you think that that would sort of map on well or? That's a good question. I, I haven't, that's a good question. I don't know what that would do. I mean, in each case, you have to explicitly compute and ask, is the system more or less uh, irreducible? I don't know. That's a good question. Th there should be an answer. I mean, it's an answerable question. I don't know what the answer is. Gotcha. So I was thinking, like, if you were to take the limit, you know, make it extremely complicated, this update function, and then take a very long sort of, uh, you know, delta T in this thing. Uh, it would start to look a lot like these input output systems, right? Uh, just an iterated map. Yeah, so they, they, look, there's no question that, of course, there is you could get something like that, and people under certain conditions behave like that. There's no question. You can behave like an automata, right? You can ask me a question, I, I mean, like we're doing. You ask me a question, I give an answer. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that consciousness is much more than that. I mean, when I go to sleep, my body's pretty immobile, right? In fact, there's this paralysis. That's how rapid eye movement sleep is defined. Almost everything is paralyzed. You know, all my most of my voluntary muscle, except my, my, uh, my eye movements, um, are paralyzed, yet I have conscious experience. If you ever had a psychedelic experience or if you ever had a near-death experience, you're sitting there you know, you might even be with eyes wide open, but you don't perceive anything. It's all in your mind. So, so yes, very often behavior and consciousness are aligned, um, but there are many conditions when you when 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 you have. In fact, you can get double dissociation. There are many conditions when there is no behavior, but you are conscious. Also, in locked in patients, of course. Versus there's also cases when people can behave but have no consciousness. Right, certain types of automatism. Or, or sleepwalking, etc. So, so they can come apart behavior and um, and and consciousness. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I think let's move on to topic three. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. By the way, Christoph, how much time do do you have for us? Yeah. I mean, I can go till quarter past or twenty past three, mm -hmm. uh, four. But, but I have another call at 4.30 okay, coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the other topic we were going to discuss was, uh, well, the implications of the IEP in 
other things, you know, other views, like, for example, the question of non-biological life. I think we already talked a little bit about that, but for example, free will, something we haven't discussed, uh, and the question of consciousness beyond our physical bodies or even beyond physical universe, more into philosophy even. <laughs> I don't know how much uh, science. Well, right, yeah, I can say something brief to each one of them. So existence, so this is not a theory about life. This is existence about consciousness. So it doesn't say anything about non-biological life. But IIT is not about life, it's about consciousness. Mm -hmm. Free will, yes. So um, IIT has a strong opinion. In fact, there's a bioarchive article we just put out that um, uh, has a strong opinion on that. Per IIT, because it's all about causal power, you know, the classical free will scenario is you're confronted with a fork in the road. You do either this or you do that, right? And then, so this is the classical libertarian uh, decision point, you know, do you do A or do you do B? And then you deliberate and you come to decision, you have reasons, and then you decide um, you want to do A versus B, okay? So according to IIT, to IT, that's a free decision in the sense that it is um, it is consciousness that does it. It's, it's free in the sense that your maximal free, of course, there's always constraints, right? Like no matter how much I want to fly, I can't fly, right? I can't violate the physical laws. But it's free in, in um, it's free in the sense it was taken uh, with the maximal amount of deliberation. And um, that's ultimately what freedom is. You think about something, you 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 decide something, you said, for these reasons, I'm going to do this and not that, and then you execute. Even though it may be perfectly predictable. For instance, if you know me, right, people who know me, who know me really well, my good friends or my partner, they can pretty well predict what I'm going to do because, you know, I have certain ethical, you know, constraints and I act by them. So um, you wouldn't want it any other way. So you you have to distinguish again here predictability, which ultimately is about correlation, from free will, which ultimately is about causation. Yes, and just because you can predict something. So predictability is different from, yes, you may be able to predict systems. That doesn't mean they're not free. That means they're predictable, which is different from, from freedom. Sorry, do you mean by predictability that there's like a chance, a, for example, a 99% chance that that person will decide on A instead of B, but there's still some kind of uncertainty. So the uncertainty of that is... Uh, of yeah, but uncertainty is different from free will, right? Yeah, you can have noise. You can have either a stochastic noise, you know, classical noise, KT, or you can have quantum mechanics uncertainty, but you don't want it, but that just makes my, my decision noisy. That's not free will, right? No, in fact, you want as little noise as um, um, as possible because once I make the decision, you know, it's just like a leader in the army or in politics. I want to be damn sure that my sensors execute what I want and that I'm not subject to some random fluctuation of some ion or some, you know, photon that comes along and, you know, and changes some binding, right? So I don't want to replace free will by by indeterminism and noise. So, 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 so the big thing to, to understand is that free will is different from predictability. In fact, you can have systems that are highly predictable, but, there's, but, uh, but they're non-causal, right? Um, and also I, uh, predictability, um, uh, free will um, and um, is very different from having just indeterminate systems, noise systems. That just means they're unpredictable, but that doesn't mean they're they're free in any in any sense. It just means they can't be predicted. Somebody else has uh, something to say. Uh, somebody online. Oh yes, and do you have something to say about uh, the third item actually? The existence of consciousness beyond the physical body and beyond the physical universe. I had this debate with His Holiness the Dalai Lama about reincarnation, you know, Buddhists, um, you know, particular types of Buddhists, particularly the Tibetan Buddhists, they, they believe in this bardo, this sort of limbo-like state, right? You die 
and then you come into this bardo, this state between lives, and then um, where your karma follows you around, and then you are depending on your karma, you get reincarnated into you know in a different person or an animal or something. And I said, well, your holiness, you know, I gave him the neuroscience mantra. No, I raised my my hand, four fingers. No brain, never mind. No brain, never mind. So you need some sort of brain. Without a brain, I, the correct formulation would be you need a mechanism. Without a mechanism, there can't be mind. So yeah, maybe it's not just the physical body. Maybe it's some you know etherized, uh, uh, you know weird substrate up in the cloud. Uh, you know, provided you have the right substrate, or maybe it's spatial. Uh, it's a grain. You know, the spatial grain itself. But, but there has to be some bodies, there has to be some material substrate, some mechanism uh, for consciousness to exist. So the bad news is once my brain, you know, un unless I somehow make a copy of my brain, digital or otherwise, once my brain dies and disintegrates, my consciousness also goes away. So in that sense, no, there isn't anything beyond, it needs a substrate, it needs a physical substrate. Without a physical substrate, there's no mind. Any other beings over there? No? Ah, yes. I don't want to apologize. No, no, please, There's please. Someone online. Yeah. Can you hear? Can you speak loud? Is there someone online? Um, I think no. There's something in the chat. I don't know. Oh. Um, yeah, it was three minutes ago, so I, I will ask this first, if you don't mind. Yeah. So Lara Chris asks, um, what is GWT actually? What is what? Huh? What is uh, I'm sorry. What's the question? Uh, I don't know if you can see the chat, uh, but she says a uh, GWT slash IIT. Oh, global neuron GNW. Is that the question? No, GWT. Global workspace theory. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. So it, I guess it's that. Um, sorry. I will yeah. So there is this large scale international collaboration between. So the two dominant theories, one is I integrated information theory, the other one is a more functionalist theory um, called global neuronal workspace. Oh. Uh, and they have some very different assumptions about consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we organized a meeting, I organized a meeting here in Seattle three, four years ago, mm -hmm. before the pandemic, where we said, well, we, we're not gonna be able to agree on the fun fundamentals because they're just too different. But let's try to see whether we can work out an experiment that could test some of the predictions of IIT versus the prediction of global neuronal workspace. And we agreed after a lot of discussion, and paper writing, and, and um, endless discussion, really over a year and a half, we agreed on an experiment. It's funded. It's a large scale experiment, 10 labs, 250 subjects using EG, MEG, and implanted electrodes in patients to test two predictions. One is the location of the neural correlates of consciousness, the NCC. Is it in the front of the brain, like uh, GNW as, assumes in pre prefrontal cortex particular, or is it in the back of cortex, like uh, integrated information presupposes in the so-called posterior hot zone? And um, what, what is the timing of consciousness? Global neuronal workspace assumes that that when you when you first become conscious of something, then there's a wave of activity, and when whatever you're conscious of disappears, there's a wave of activity, but nothing in between. IIT asserts that as long as you're conscious of something, there will be some physical, some correlate, and so that's being tested right now, and it's going to be announced the result I think in a half a year from now. Oh wow, that's very soon. Do you have any any teasers? <laughs> I'd rather not speak about it, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Now you can ask your question, please. Mm -hmm. um, so, on the subject of the third point there about the existence of the uh, consciousness beyond the physical body and uh, the physical universe, uh, I was sort of curious how you might connect that or if there is any connection with ideas relating to mathematical Platonism, where, you know, there's the idea that this uh, you know, mathematical universe sort of exists separately and 
make this without needing to have any physical manifestation, even yep. if, uh, you know, we don't necessarily know about it yet, it's still this structure that sort of exists. Do you think that that sort of idea of uh, structure existing outside of this, you know, physical universe may also apply to, you know, the mental realm and the consciousness realm? Because, you know, it seems like the, as I said earlier, the conscious stuff uh, is sort of separate from the physical stuff uh, with respect to these viewpoints uh, the, in the second bullet point. Yeah, so it's a, uh, there's a theory formulated by um, Sir John Eccles, Nobel laureate for synaptic transmission, and <laughs> Karl Popper, so-called, uh, it has three worlds. It has the physical world of physics, including the brain. It has the world of conscious experience. And then it has this more ma this world of, of mathematical ideas, the idea of justice and truth and God and pi and, you know, E, Etc. And then, of course, Sir Roger Penrose, you know, uh, is a is a very um, avid proponent of this idea. Per IT, this world exists in our heads. Clearly, you know, I can imagine pie, and I can imagine the idea of truth or America. Let's say these are all abstract ideas, but they don't have independent existence in the sense that once I die or people die, you know, there was no idea about pie before there were people around. Uh, there was no idea of America or, or truth uh, before there were people around to think about truth. So, so they don't exist for themselves. They depend on sort of they depend on humans in protect, you know, not just all humans, but highly literary people who are educated and adults, etc. Right? Babies don't have idea of universal justice or America or pie. Um, and so in that sense, they don't have uh, they don't have independent existence and they don't have causal powers. All the causal powers they have is through the causal powers of people who believe in them. Because Sir Roger Penrose believes in it and is a good speaker, he can influence other people, but that's of course through him. They, they don't directly, Pi or the idea of truth or America doesn't, doesn't have causal power by itself. It's all through human. No, so, so per IT, they don't, you, I mean, you can say, yes, once I die, I will continue to exist in the memory of my children, right? That's not really what I want. If I talk about immortality, I'd like to exist by myself, not just in the memory of my kids or other people. Um, just to push back slightly on the independent existence of these things, you know, outside of humans, uh, you know, if we were to all go away and some other, you know, alien species or, you know, humans in the future- who? Redis but then it would depend on their mind. Do you think so? Like, because yeah, then they, they might discover it. Like, how would they arrive at alternate conclusions as to the value of pi or, or other? It would still be pi. It would still be, yeah. yeah. Like, they presumably would arrive at the same number. They wouldn't presumably arrive at the idea of America because that's probably particular yeah. to a particular historical context. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I'm referring to the mathematical Platonism idea, like that it it seems to exist outside of you know our physical or our uh, you know conscious perception of them. It no, it exists in, it requires minds. Let's put it that way. Human minds or maybe the minds of other intelligences, yes, but without those, and other minds can invent it, I grant you that, but that's not, that's not autonomous existence for itself. Even though it'll be reinvented in the same way, largely due to the fact that- Well, that we don't know. That's, a, that's, a, that's an assumption. You know, maybe aliens think about it radically different. I don't know. We, we have no example of an alien around, unfortunately. So- I mean, I suppose Raman Huji, like, you know, people who grow, you know, are mathematical geniuses who grew up in solitude and sort of redrive a lot of stuff or have their own ways of getting to these things. Yep, yeah, yeah, you have a kind of- very rigid structure that exists, you know, but again, they, they're all, you know, they're human minds. So my point is it's, it's secondary existence. They don't have a causal power upon themselves. All the causal powers they have is through the causal power of the mathematician. That's what I would say. You, can, you can't ever prove that another brain cannot arrive there because the only way you can perceive the world is through the human brain, regardless, like all billion, eight or seven billion people just think through the human brain, right? So there's, there isn't any way of proving that any other brain can arrive to the same numbers. So I guess what you were saying is that these universal constants exist whether or not we perceive them as such. They can be perceived as such by other sentients as well. 
Uh, yeah, yeah so I, I mean, uh, look, yeah. I assume that other intelligences could come up, you know, if you read contact, that other, you know, intelligences will also have a notion of pi. I, I have no problem with that. All I'm saying that's different from assuming that they exist independent. And most importantly for IT, they don't have causal power. All the causal power they have is, is graced to being instantiated in a particular brain of either human or some alien. I think it's also like a whole different debate where mathematics are a creation or a discovery. I have had this yes. in the past for It's a hours. long debate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think just in the sake of the discussion, we should move on. Um, we have two last questions. I don't know for how long can you stay for us, but uh, I will at least move to the next one. If we uh, can take both of them together. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, it depends on what people would like to ask. So it does New York Times have all the answers or is there opportunity for interdisciplinary research on mind and slash consciousness? And I mean, uh, what place do introspection and meditation have in this quest of mind slash consciousness? Well, ultimately, in order to test the theory, we have to, as I said before, because the only subjects that we're really very certain of are conscious are sort of adult, adult human beings. But there is, um, you know, it's a very wide field. There's neuroscience and there's a clinical part. Then there is a physics part. So for example, is or is not quantum mechanics relevant? Um, there's psychology, right? Because we really want to map out in great, great detail the kind of experiences. Because you not need to explain not only or why certain systems are conscious, but the exact type of consciousness, right? Why does um, an apple taste so much different from, um, from an avocado? Why does, you know, the structure of space, you know, it's very different from the fact that time flows. Time is experienced very different from space. Colors are experienced very different from sound or from motion. So all of that needs to be explained. You need to map out the microphenomenology of each state. Uh, there's a lot of re really interesting research now ongoing around psychedelics, right? They, to try to understand the exact type of experiences, particularly these unusual uh, um, experiences called mystical experiences, near-death experiences, peak experiences that people report um, to try to understand them. So that requires A, introspection, but B, also tools from psychology. Um, and and allied fields, uh, plus of course you know traditional philosophy. So lots of people uh, have contributed and will con continue to contribute to to this question of um, how does mind, how does consciousness arise? Somebody has something to say. Um, my, my only comment I'm, for the sake of what I when I started my studies in astronomy in the university is like I took a philosophy course and it's like at the very end any any field or any any particular approach to understanding something has a baseline that it's philosophically debatable you know I mean science has a minimum assumption that I mean at, at least physics that the world itself is a has some logical rules that we can experiment upon, right? Yes. So it's, yeah, and neuroscience has the same. So, like, I, unless neuroscience ex, uh, explains everything about the brain, uh, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's like so obvious to say neuroscience will have all the answers, right? Because at the very end, it has an assumption, you know, that we can Correct. study the mind, right? Correct. But maybe if there's something beyond that that is like philosophical rather than scientific that uh, it's necessary in order to actually understand what is consciousness. Well, I think, I mean, as I, we started out, you need a proper ontology. You need to define, and that starts out in philosophy, but then of course, the big difference to philosophy, look, philosophy is great. You need to read a lot of philosophy and they ask good questions, but finally they, they're impotent at answering any of them, right? In fact, right now, panpsychism that used to be, you know, last thought about really popular 2000 years ago is now back. There's no progress in philosophy, right? There's no progress in philosophy of mind, none. People are debating the same problems again, again, you know, every century. So philosophy is useless, it's, it's useful to have, to think about the foundation, but ultimately it's gotta, you've gotta take it into a scientific domain when, and where, where you can test things. Ultimately, if you can test things, you can predict things, you can test things, that ultimately is a proof. 
the proof of the pudding is in the eating. In this case, can you make uh, valid predictions? When does consciousness happen? Who has it? Who doesn't have it? Can you manipulate it in lawful ways? Can you engineer it, etc.? Without that, we're going to you know, discuss these questions for, for the rest of human history. And there won't be a progress. So that's why we need a science of consciousness. And of course, neuroscience will have a big part in that because in us, at least, the brain is the organ of consciousness, not cardiology, not the heart, as, as people, most people thought, you know, through most of time, it's brain. So, you know, and so the, the plumbers of the brain, so to speak, those are neuroscientists. So that's why uh, neuroscience will be important, but will not be the only science that's relevant for understanding consciousness. May anyone online have a question or a comment? You were mentioning, sorry, uh, yeah. you were mentioning before that you would always require a physical substrate or a medium in order to arrive to any conclusions regarding to the existence of consciousness and the previous discussion on generating numbers and deep fakes and so on. So I guess that the best starting point would have to be through measuring brain activity in specific contexts in, in uh, trying to pinpoint consciousness. Uh, I haven't read enough on this, and I should, but would you have an example on how you think that can be achieved, or is this too complicated? No, I mean, this is so. This is sort of uh, what people do for their PhD. This is what I did when I was at Caltech doing this research. This is what people do. They, uh, so let's say, a recent experiment. They show you things, and then they mask them. So they, I briefly show you an image, let's say, of a fire truck versus an in, um, a drawing of a face for 20 milliseconds. But before and afterwards, I show you two other images. It's called sandwich masking. If I do this very briefly, you don't see it. If I immediately follow it with another image, if it precedes or follows by another image, it's called visual masking. So now I can compare this showing just the, um, the, the brief image or the brief image and the mask. And I can, in fact, you can also do this in mice. And then you can show, okay, where's the difference? In both cases, it's the same 20 millisecond input to the retina, but in one case, because it's followed by another image, immediately it's not perceived. And in in, uh, if there is no following mask, it is perceived. So, for, so there, this is one of many, many ways people have sort of um, discovered or perfected over the last 100 years how you can manipulate content to make it consciously, particularly in the visual domain, but not only where it's um, visible or, it, or it's, it's not visible. So that's one very popular technique. Another technique is you take a person who's conscious and then you take the person when the person is asleep or when the person is anesthetized. So there's a variety of different approaches um, to, um, and, and, and to study. I just, re I just reviewed a paper on near-death experiences where they take people on, um, that are on life support uh, in the clinic that have a, a heart attack, cardiac arrest, and then uh, they look at the EG, and in a subset of people, they have a brief period of EG after the heart stops, particularly in a high-frequency domain called the gamma, the gamma range. And that typically is associated with what's called near-death experiences, where people report that you know they, they had some very intense experience. Sometimes they, they meet religious figures, God or, or demons, or they visit hell, or they, visit, they see people they haven't talked, uh, uh, that have died, etc. And so there, you, again, you can associate, okay, this, this intensely felt experience, you can associate it with a particular type of brain activity in a particular spectrum, in a particular region of the brain. So there are lots of experiments like that. Thank you. Maybe we can end on one point. And uh, Christoph, this is Kunal again. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we've gone beyond your 60 minute limit, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank Maybe you. just you can express your views on <clears throat> this one point and uh, perhaps uh, the others can continue the discussion and you could log off. But uh, uh, what is what are your thoughts on uh, David Chalmers uh, view of reality, virtual reality or simulated reality? If consciousness is something different from this physical reality and it's, it's like a virtual world of some sort where you have an avatar, I suppose. That's my understanding of it. And yes, there can be correlations, like neural, correlation, uh, neural correlates of consciousness, but this is just a simulated reality. There's nothing more to it, where we have, yes, all these rules of like physical laws and other kinds of laws embedded within this virtual reality. But 
uh, all you can see here is correlates. There is no consciousness there. And consciousness is something independent of the simulated world itself. So do you have any uh, perspectives on that or any anything to add further uh, than what we just discussed? No, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of these thought experiments. I mean, they're fun, they're enjoyable, but uh, as I said before, and as you just also express, it's all bit, yeah, I can get computer simulation to do lots of different things. You know, you can play God of War and get all these characters doing whatever they do, but that's all simulated behavior. That's not, that's not consciousness. Yeah. And as computers get better and better, their behavior will more and more closely, you know, approximate us. So that's not much different from talking to Siri or Amazon, uh, or Siri or, or um, Amazon. So I don't think it, that teaches us. But there's another cute experiment I'll leave you with that does teach us something about reality. Do you guys know the dress? Yes. You mean the... Uh... Yeah, maybe while I talk, you can just put up the dress. So the dress is this phenomenon, right? It went viral in 2015. Half the people see it. Well, we can ask. If you just put, um, if you just go dress Wikipedia and just go to the image on, Wiki, on the Wikipedia, just do dress or the dress in Wikipedia. Yeah, there it is. And just click on, on, uh, on the Wikipedia page, the dress. Yeah, th that one. Yeah, the, yeah, that one, and just um, pull it up. So how do so how do people see it? Blue with black, yeah. White yes. with gold. Really? Well. I shall leave you with this. Roughly half of people see it white and gold, and half of people see it blue and black. This is not a visual illusion that flips. You know, there's this rabbit. Uh, rabbit duck illusion or old woman young woman illusion etc no this is you stably see it i see it as white and gold it's obviously white and gold but half of humanity sees it obviously as black and blue now you can ask is there an underlying reality to it is there a matter of the fact is it either one or the other the answer is no it's all constructed it's a beautiful example of every conscious person being a construction of our brain and, and depending on the assumption you make, your brain makes implicitly about, about color and brightness, et cetera, you either implicitly see it as, as uh, white and gold or, or blue and black. But there is no, what there is underlying, the, the, what actually there is out there is a continuous surface that's being illuminated, uh, illuminated by continuous light source, the, the sun. And all that light comes into our retina and is collected you know, to three different buckets, to three different photoreceptors, but there is no color out there. Color is a construct of your brain. And different people make different assumptions and therefore come, uh, give rise to different, uh, to different percepts. So that's about the real. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you, Thank Christoph. You. Thank, Thank you so you much. much Ciao, ciao.